Can everyone see this, the metabolomics and exposomics slide? Yes. Okay, so um, uh, for uh, any resources, you can just jump down to the little website at the very bottom of the page here and click that. That has uh, you know, our laboratory website and you can get a lot of information from there. Um, so my disclosures are that I'm an unpaid scientific advisor for um, three groups and I also receive research funding um, from a company developing Suramen to treat autism spectrum disorders. So the background literature, I, I've um, highlighted the PMIDs in, in uh, Cayenne, um, uh, so you can quickly look at these. But you know, basically, they, um, these are some of my published papers um, uh, that tie into this work. Um, and this, since it's being recorded, you'll, you'll be able to, to you know, uh, take a look at any of these that you like. So the outline of my talk is starts, the first half of the slides are going to be based talking about the why we do what we do. And the second half is the what we found. Okay. Um, and so we'll talk about the philosophical foundations of a new medical perspective of chronic illness, regeneration and healing. We'll talk about the cell danger response, the healing and aging cycle. And then we'll talk about some of our results from uh, uh, metabolomics and exposomics, and then the convergent lessons um, that are emerging from 10 clinical metabolomic studies we've completed. And then I'll end with some statistical caveats, uh, you know, um, from the battleground of big data analysis. Okay, okay to start out our philosophical um, section, um, I start with a quote by John Dryden in a poem from 1681 that self-defense is nature's oldest law. So we've all received from our ancestors all the genes that they needed to survive every pandemic, every famine, every hard winter, at least until they had their first child. So those are the genes that we've inherited. <laughs> okay. Um, and, uh, it, but the environment's changed. And so, you know, those genes are not enough. Um, another quote that I like is from Nelson Mandela, and he says that when a deep injury is done to us, we can never heal until we forgive. And then I'll, and then, you know, I was talking to Keith last night, um, and he asked this similar question. How does a cell decide when to forgive? Obviously, that's a, that's a metaphor, um, and begin to heal. And so the answer is a cell will only redirect resources, you know, and those resources are both energetic and material resources, so matter and energy and information, away from cellular defense toward healing when it receives the signals that say the future is safe. And the correlation, is, the corollary is, is that regeneration and healing can't proceed until persistent triggers of the cell danger response are removed. Okay, like if you keep ripping the scab off, a, off of an abrasion, it's going to take you much longer um, to heal and you're going to have scarring. Okay, if you keep, if that keeps happening. So then this big question, overarching question, why do people become chronically ill? Well, I believe that that's because they have encountered a perfect storm of, of usually dozens of environmental and genetic factors that produce or persistently reactivate an injury and then block the normal cycle of healing. And the corollary is, is that all chronic illness represents a failure of our ancestral genes and our inherited epigenetic modifications to adequately manage the response to environmental conditions that we've experienced. And so basically it leads to this logical tautology. People are sick because they can't get better, okay? Like, you know, so, so why can't they get better? Well, you know, I believe it's that the, the information is in the molecular analysis of the healing process itself. So the organizing principles of, of our research um, start out with this one fundamental fact. Injury is universal. Living cells try to heal themselves and cells that can't heal cannot transmit their DNA to the next generation. So they don't and they die, they die and those genes, that gene, you know, that gene set dies out. Chronic illness, illnesses are the result of a mismatch between genes, environment, and the developmental timing of the injury exposure. So 
gene by e, you know gene by environment by timing or you know we refer to this as ecogenetics. And then finally, the the last you know organizing principle that Chauvin uh, you know um, ha, has iconized, um, and, and that is metabolism is the real time interaction of genes and environment. So our genes give us you know a certain plasticity to respond to environmental insults. And so metabolism lives in the moment. And I'll follow this up by saying metabolism is fractal. There are, um, uh, it's like an ancient oak tree where there are uh, metabolites that are trunk metabolites that don't change at all. There are very thick branches. And then there are leaves that flutter in the wind. And even those can be remarkably useful in um, uh, in understanding disease, for example, one of the, the metabolites that flutters in the wind like a leaf is glucose. But we know that fasting glucose can be very useful in um, looking at someone's insulin resistance or sensitivity. Okay, so that's for you, Chauvin, <laughs> down at the bottom right. Okay, so, okay, so um, the take home messages are that pathogenesis does not equal salogenesis, and I'll define that word, but it's basically the process of injury does not equal the process of healing. This is really fundamental and absolutely a missing piece of medical approach to disease um, that we all were trained in. So the cell danger response and mitochondria coordinate both of these processes, and metabolomics can be used as, for both pre-symptomatic risk assessment, triage diagnosis, and, and prognosis. Okay, so where does this leave us? So we cannot see what we cannot imagine. Um, I'm, you know, well, I won't go into this, will take too long if I go into too many analogies, but I'll say our training creates subliminal limits or unrecognized horizons in our vision so that, you know, new tools and models, you know, can be used to extend our scientific vision. So sometimes in order to see, you know, uh, a, a new world, all you need is to create a new lens or a microscope or a telescope or a mass spectrometer. So a paradigm shift is needed to understand chronic illness. Um, and you know, I'll say this many times throughout the talk, acute disease is not the same as chronic disease. You cannot use the same principles and hope to get the same results. So I consider acute disease the last five, the, the medicine in book one is the last 5,000 years of recorded human history where we really focused on managing what happens if you break a bone, trauma, or poisoning, or if you have infections. So medicine's gotten good at this. But book two of medicine is really anything per, that persists for longer than six months. Okay. All right. So Imagine a vibrantly healthy human as, you know, this house on the left before disease. Well, you can suffer injury and there are mechanisms of injury. In this case, it's a fire. Um, that is my metaphor for pneumococcal pneumonia or um, a, you know, viral encephalitis. Okay. We are trained to identify the mechanisms of injury and then to treat those. Okay, so we can treat that fire. Um, but then what we're left with is, you know, a house that is destroyed. Now, most of, most of all of first book medicine stops with step, this step three and then relies on spontaneous healing to occur. We do this so subconsciously that it's automatic that if we give, you know, let's say penicillin for a pneumococcal pneumonia, we just assume that all the pulmonary, you know, destruction that has occurred as part of the infection will heal itself. Okay, and we forget that's an active process. So rebuilding requires active healing, or what I call solid genesis. And, and that is what I believe is a missing, a, a critically missing component of modern medicine. So Salus was the Roman goddess of personal health, welfare, and safety. Um, and, you know, this slide starts with basically saying that um, path, healing is not the reverse of pathogenesis. So we can start with health. You can suffer a traumatic injury, you know, be exposed to toxic metals 
chemicals or pollution or viruses, um, tobacco, infections of different kinds, and get over to the right square, this red square, which is a chronic illness. But it turns out, so we can study that, and what First Book Medicine teaches us is we just eliminate those problems and everything will get better. Okay, that's what First Book Medicine, but that's not how living systems work. That's how you repair a damaged or imperfect Hubble telescope, is you analyze its optical properties, you create a fix, you fly it up, install it, and then you, you, know, you, you enjoy the fruits of your, your engineering fix. That's not how cells repair themselves, okay? So there's a beginning and a middle and an end to this process of returning back to health that requires transformation of mitochondria from different pheno developmental phenotypes, what I call M1, M0, and M2 mitochondria, okay? So in this first book of medicine, um, treatments of chronic illnesses will lead to palliation. So they're usually symptomatically based. So you, if someone has a headache, you can give them an, an aspirin or you can, you know, uh, remove the hammer that keeps hitting them, okay? So, um, so based on the word salus, uh, you know, we've uh, used this word salogenesis to describe the molecular and cellular events that are necessary for um, going from a state of injury to a state of health. And that's what I call second book medicine. And what I believe that treatments that really focus on this second book on healing actually leverage the internal ability of cells to, to use, um, you know, information is stored in our DNA and, uh, and as, as well as energy produced by our cells and material resources in the form of amino acids and nucleotides and fatty acids. And, and, and sugars, okay. So I gave this talk in April of last year at NIH. And the organizer that invited me, you know, said, great talk, Dr. Navi, but I hope you're wrong. And I said, well, why is that? Well, if you're right, it means that the National Institutes of Health has been funding only, only the first limb of a two limb problem. We've only really been funding, you know, understanding the pathogenesis of illness and not the salogenesis. So, so for 70 years almost, the NIH has really focused on building deep silos of, of, of knowledge for many, many different diseases, for primary mitochondrial disease, autism, uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, Gulf War. I, I put these here, these silos here, because these are the silos, um, well, 10 of these are, are ones that we've already studied, and ALS, Parkinson, and Alzheimer are, are ones that we would like that we will be studying over the next few years. And so what people, by building these deep silos of knowledge, have done is they have focused on the differences between illnesses. And, and what we are focusing on is the similarities, this hidden the commonality that all diseases share is they, in order to get back to health, there is an underlying root to this, the process of, of recovery. So the things that make chronic diseases the same are more important for healing than their differences. So this has you know, political and social implications for our, our you know, unrest in America at the moment, but really it's our similarities that are more, more important for healing than our differences. So how did I get into this? Well, I got into it because of patients with primary forms of, of mitochondrial disease, genetic forms of mitochondrial disease. So these are diseases called MELAS and NARP and, and uh, Alpers syndrome. We actually discovered the gene that causes the, the you know, the old, causes Alpers syndrome, um, which is the oldest Mendelian form of mitochondrial disease, first described in 1931. But anyway, so, under health conditions, mitochondria are a reticulum. They are a, a, almost a root system that, that go throughout the cytoplasma of a cell. So here are two HeLa cells next to one another down at the bottom with an interconnected connected, uh, uh, you know, network of mitochondria. But when there's any kind of injury, 
mitochondria fragment and they change their metabolism and they become pro-inflammatory. Okay, so these are anti-inflammatory organelles that are consuming oxygen. These are pro-inflammatory organelles that are no longer consuming oxygen efficiently. When health is restored, the mitochondrial reticulum um, is restored. They're reconnected. But when that's blocked, they remain disconnected. This disconnection has been, you know, has been seen also even on the space station when you grow cells in microgravity, you know, mitochondrial would become disconnected. So anyway, when this happens, when you're blocked to healing, you know, 60% of adults in the world today suffer with at least one chronic illness and actually 40% of children, um, you know, uh, in their, you know, up through their teens um, suffer with at least one chronic illness. So we've conducted over a dozen different studies, two in autism and two in chronic fatigue syndrome, but also Gulf War illness and post-traumatic stress disorder, traumatic brain injury, recurrent major depressive disorder with and without suicidal ideation, an autoimmune liver disease called primary sclerosing cholangitis. We've studied exercise and aging and these primary mitochondrial diseases, and then a, a, a longevity default pathway in, in C. elegans called Dower uh, and some breast milk biomarkers that I'll, I'll talk about. Well, where does that all lead us? It leads us to what we call the cell danger response. So the core pathways of the cell danger response are regulated uh, in, in over a dozen chronic illnesses that we've studied. And so if you think of measuring metabolites, a set of metabolites that are unique for a particular disease, as well as metabolites that are, that are shared uh, and pathways specifically that are shared by different diseases, what you come up with is something that looks like a sunflower, where the, the shared pathways are the pathways of the cell danger response. And those involve purines and pyrimidines, phospholipids, acylcarnitines, fatty acids, sphingolipids, icosanoids and endocannabinoids, cholesterol, folate B12 metabolism, I can go through it, but basically all these are, are part of a system of cogs and wheels that are coordinately regulated. These are not things that are activated in isolation. They do not work in isolation. They work as an integrated system. So what is the cell danger response? So here's a, you know, a, a cartoon of a cell. An archetypal stress was a viral infection. And one of the first things that happens is, I'll point your attention to number four over here, is actually a, a conversion of, of filamentous mitochondria to, uh, to segmented mitochondria. We call this the spaghetti to meatball transformation. Okay, so this is, you know, and that's, that's actually not just a joke, it's what the mitochondriacs call it, okay? So this is spaghetti to meatball transformation. But when that happens, then the intracellular dissolved oxygen concentration rises. When that, when that happens, then NADPH oxidases are activated and superoxide and hydrogen peroxide are created, and you get a, a host of many other things. So this is an ontogenetic response, meaning that it's a developmental as well as genetic response initiated by what I call electron steals because mitochondria regulate their metabolism according to the electrons they receive from metabolism. When those electrons are stolen for, by a virus, let's say, so, so to make its own proteins, uh, its own lipids for cell envelopes um, uh, or nucleic acids, then there's fewer of those that are, are available to mitochondria. And that results in this, this um, filamentous to, to um, frag, fragmented uh, morphological transformation. And so I'll refer you to, to the, the paper. We can go through, I won't go through everything here, but the, the important thing is, is that this is a coordinated response, but people tend to look at this through a keyhole of their own research interests. So some people might just look at sphingolipids. Other people might look at cholesterol or fatty acids. Some people might look at, you know, demethylation of DNA. Um, some people might look at endogenous retroviral sequence activation, okay? These are all coordinately regulated responses. 
All right, so again, to nail this home, so we start in a condition of health. This is first book of medicine, acute illness. We have an injury. Doctors will look after the airway, breathing, and circulation. You do first aid, you provide symptomatic treatment, and because this black box is intact, most of the time people get better. But if the black box of healing is not, you know, getting better, then it, it tips us into this repeating loop of chronic illness. Okay, so now if we just start with this as a, a, a dysfunction, as a problem, a, a, as, a, as a starting assumption in all chronic illness that results from a variety of different problems that are relevant either for children in psychosocial deprivation states or rewounding in, in adults, um, it'll pull us into this repeating loop. Okay. Um, but if we unpack that black box and start analyzing it with the, the tools of systems biology, we can begin to see that there's actually a, a, an organized sequence of events that happen. And I call these the cell danger response one, two, and three. And we'll go through those a little later. But if you unblock that, then healing is restored and, and health can be restored. So this is such an ancient response. Plants have it too. So this is a Rhabdopsis. This is a little cricket bite over here. Turns out if you just add glutamate or ATP to this, you know, this genetically modified Arabidopsis that has, it will fluoresce green in the presence of uncaged calcium, this is what happens. Okay. So everyone see that? You know, so that's a, the plant within 90 seconds transmits the injury that it receives in one leaf to all parts of the plant, okay? Humans are even better at dealing with, at doing this. Okay, so we spend our, most of our life in this health cycle of wakeful activity and nutrient intake. We, that activity releases a little bit of extracellular ATP that then has to get metabolized to adenosine, which is necessary for the induction of sleep. If you don't have adenosine, you, you can't have normal restorative sleep, okay? Once that's metabolized, then you can wake up again. So, um, so if, the, if the injury is very significant, um, let's say with a viral infection and there's been cell loss or excitotoxicity, cell loss, um, then the first stage of the cell danger response is activated. That's inflammation. It's, it, it's like trying to you know, seal off the bulkheads of a submarine that has been you know, injured so that the rest of the, of the submarine will not be destroyed uh, when one compartment becomes filled. So that's what this containment innate immunity is all about. And there's a very specific type of metabolism called glycolysis that is used during that time. Let's see. So, and and th this can be activated by an, any number of different things. And so I have uh, a stimulated emission uh, uh, video of mitochondria after they've sustained a stress. And within five minutes, they transform from the spaghetti to meatball transformation, you know, configuration. That, that changes them from pro, pro from pro, antioxidative, anti you know, basically anti-inflammatory to pro-inflammatory organelles. All right. So those, these spherical mitochondria, we call the M1 mitochondria. M2, M0s are uh, pluripotential. They can actually um, uh, be both, go, differentiate into M1 or M2 mitochondria. An M2 are the more filamentous um, uh, oxphos dependent forms of mitochondria. Okay. So these are just the very specific stages of metabolism that always exist. It doesn't matter what the injury is, whether it's a broken leg, a, a cut, a scrape, a myocardial infarction, or a stroke. So now is the second half of the talk. So Metabolomics and exposomics, um, when we draw a blood sample, 
we think of it as a little microcosm of all the resources that all the cells in our body, both the bacterial cells as well as our, the human cells, need for growth and repair, as well as all the, their waste products. And we can analyze those you know, um, by a half million dollar machine here, a, a, a triple quadruple mass spectrometer for metabolomics. And for exposomics, um, we can look at environmental toxicants um, using gas chromatography, triple quadruple mass spectrometry. And the workflow is basically take a sample, add internal standards that are C13 or N15 uh, or, or deuterated standards, um, run them through an HPLC, run them through the mass spec, isolate and fragment the ions, um, and then put them through a statistical analysis in order to come up with pathway changes um, that are reflective of the underlying biochemistry of the illness. So at UCSD, we have, you know, um, we, so this is, an ex, this is an illustration of the kinds of um, uh, molecules that we interrogate by GCMS and LCMS on the, the exposomic side. So 1,232. And then we have on the endogenous side, um, 690 molecules that we interrogate. Um, from over 63 different uh, biochemical pathways. So overall, that's 1,922 chemicals that we measure. So this is an example of the receiver operator characteristic curves for um, uh, 10 different studies that we've done. Each one of these represents a half million dollars of research by five different people in our lab. And you can see that using metabolomics produces rock curve accuracies of about you know, 0.85 up to 1.0 in, in experimental model, mo models like C. elegans. But even in depression, um, uh, where, where we're looking at cerebral spinal fluid or plasma, the accuracy of diagnosis is still very high. But what we found through these studies is that the actual prognostic value of metabolomics is even stronger than its diagnostic. So you have to imagine that we, when you take a blood sample from someone, you are really try, getting a snapshot of a moving train. Every person is on a, a train that is taking them to a particular location. We'd like that location to be, you know, one of vibrant health, but people with chronic illness will be on a train that takes them into the future with multiple organ um, uh, uh, morbidities and, and uh, typically exaggerated uh, symptoms. So in this, in this study of um, uh, men and women with recurrent major depressive disorder, um, we took a sample at time zero, and then we followed them into the future and determined how long it took them it, before they had a recurrence of their um, depressive symptoms. And for, for women, it, it was all, about 600 days, and for men, it was about 300 days in this study. But when we use metabolomics to begin to, to see if we could predict which person would relapse and which would have sustained, uh, you know, absence of symptoms, we found that there were dozens of metabolites, and I, I'll give you just one is methylcysteine. If we just, you know, stratified the patients into the, those who had the highest level of methylcysteine uh, in the blue down here, and those that had the lowest levels of methylcysteine, um, it allowed us to, to you know, tell um, the, the, well, so the median time to, to relapse was um, 400, uh, days here um, in the orange for those who had low levels um, and those who had high levels had uh, you know actually over 850 days of uh, symptom free um, recovery. Same thing for males, we can do the same thing for males you know with area under the curve uh, for rock curve accuracy that over 90 percent. We've also looked at you know we're interested in newborn screening and autism 
And so, you know, we not only are doing work with newborn um, dried blood spots that are um, uh, taken at the time of birth of every child in the United States, but we are also looking at um, the uh, breast milk because this is the chemistry of breast milk changes according to, well, just to start out, turns out that, you know, we can sample, take a sample of any breast milk and tell you whether that breast milk is being made for a baby girl or for a baby boy. So the, the milk chemistry changes according to the needs of the child. Okay. And so in this study, we took frozen bread, breast milk samples um, at three different times then followed the children for three years. And then went back in time, so we, then we began looking at the children who had critical neurodevelopmental risks and went back in time to their, blood, their breast sam bre milk samples. And what we found is that with eight biomarkers in the milk, we could identify with 91% accuracy uh, the children, in this case, 23 children at critical risk and with, uh, from 40 neurodevelopmental control, normal controls. All right. All right. So the, the last part of this is, you know. Can I, can I interject there for one second? Sure. Yeah, I just wanted to ask you to which extent you think this correlation, there's any form of causality or it's just something that, you know, because these kids have that problem. Uh, impact. What is your interpretation of this correlation? What is what is causing? Well, the, yeah. So the information is actually in the details over on the left here. It turns out that um, cerebrosides, basically these lipids that are of critical importance for developing brains, are fortified in the milk of mothers um, who have children who are struggling neurodevelopmentally. So for using for however the biological connection is made between mother and child, you know through smell and sight and, and scent and touch. Um, the mother's milk is fortified with, uh, you know, basically these dihexosilceramides, um, uh, and a variety of different phospholipids, monohexosilceramides. These are glycosphingal lipids that are cerebrosides that are necessary um, uh, in, in the, for brain development of a child. So, the mother, make, the mother whose child is struggling the most makes the most. Mm -hmm. So you will predict that a lack of those uh, cerebrocytes would actually directly potentially be causative of the disorder. No, I don't think of it that way. Um, I always think of everything as a reactionism. I, I, okay, so, um, so... It's an expression of the change in the homeostasis, if you wish, or anything yeah. like that. Yeah, so I... I I, uh, yeah, so, the, so I always see this, yeah, as the body's response to a problem, okay? Um, and, uh, yeah, and so the interesting thing was is that the milk for neurodevelopmentally normal children had mm. lower levels of these molecules, mm. just meaning that normal kids, you know, that on a normal course, don't need as much cerebrosides in order to have a normal brain. But the kids that are having problems, um, you know, are helped by, you know, this maternal child uh, chemistry, chemical bond. Thank you. Okay. So this is a big data question. Basically, if, if the number of samples N is much less than the number of parameters measured, then you can run into problems that frequently are, um, you know, not obvious. So we performed a, a little simulation study where we used a random number generator to, um, to populate a matrix of 691 metabolites in 60 patient samples, so 30 cases. And then just basically just randomly divided that, those 60 samples into two, you know, so controls and cases. And lo and behold, when we use multivariate statistical analysis, so, you know, basically any, whether you use PCA or partially squared screen analysis, you get similar result. Basically, you can always find metabolites that um, are discriminating between the two groups. You know, I've named them ASD and TD here, but really they're just, you know, cases and controls. Um, uh, but the thing that there's already a, a there's a caveat here for anybody who knows metabolism is that 
these metabolites come from many different pathways that uh, without they're randomly selected from different pathways okay there's not an intensification or hierarchical structure to um, these results and if we just re-randomize the same data set we get a, a completely different set of metabolites and if we look at you know let's say we thought that that first was going to be a discovery set and that second one might be a validation set uh, set from a different, you know, um, clinical study that you one study might be done in Philadelphia, another might be done in San Diego. When you look at this, lo and behold, you get two metabol 12 metabolites that are shared by these, you know, two, and remember, these are random data sets, okay. And in the literature, a lot of people would say, okay, that's what's shared. That's what's important is these 12 things. Okay, well, wrong. Now I'm going to Tell, I'm going to give you a, a kind of a quick trick that we use in order to tell the difference between strong studies and weak studies. If you just take, let's say we have, so we have 691 metabolites, and we can take the, the p-values, and that can be, you know, so, so um, a non-parametric p-value would be a Mann-Whitney U-test p-value, and then um, you could use a student's t or a Welch's if you're, if the, the, which is what you would choose if the distribution is still symmetric, but the variances are different between the groups. But anyway, if you take all those p-values and you just do a histogram, frequency histogram, you'll see it's roughly equivalent, you know, from the lowest values to the highest values. And in fact, what's interesting is that it comes up, you know, so Q is just, a, you know, the Bayesian F false discovery rate. Um, if you take 0.05, times the number of metabolites, you get about 35, which is the average of all these little columns, bars, okay? So this is a weak study that is generated from random data. It's very easy to do too. I mean, this is a very easy thing to rapidly assess the quality of data from big data sets. Now, here's an example of a couple strong metabolomic studies. So here's a mouse study. Turns out it was only 15 animals, seven controls, and eight, you know, um, uh, you know, animals that were happened to be injected with ATP. But you can see that there is a very strong, you know, um, uh, increase toward the low p values. Okay. And in a human study, um, you can see also that there's a very strong increase in, in uh, the, toward the low p-values, okay? Um, this is really very dramatic and easy to do to uh, rapidly assess the quality of any, you know, big data set. Is that a description of all pairwise interactions that you could have within the data set, every, every interaction among all of the 691 or whatever the case may be? It's related, but that gets into Pearson and Spearman matri matrices. So it turns out you can also determine, um, you know, p-values for every, every pairwise analysis in a, in a Pearson matrix or a Spearman matrix and do exactly the same thing and you'll get the same results. So it's, it's, it's very, very useful, you know, uh, quick test, okay? Um, so now if you do a, you know, random, we like random forest because it, it's very um, robust or resistant to overfitting uh, your model. And in this example, which was generated from a random data set, the out of the box error was 0. 0.6. And, you know, we like to see out of the box errors of below 0. 0.25. Okay. I won't go through a lot of this. This is just another example. Um, again, this particular out of the box error was again 0 0.6 and, and this is, you know, again, we want to be below 0.25. So now if you have a strong data set, this is what you get. So the out of the box error, the misclassification was zero. You know, so in these animals, okay. And in, in this particular one, which is another strong data set from uh, major depressive disorder, it was 0.17. So again, below our, our 0.25, you know, um, optimal threshold. 
you can do, you know, heat maps and you can make yourself believe that, you know, a, some random data set is going to be different, you know, um, uh, between cases and controls. But, uh, you know, this is what a real, on the right is what a real, you know, strong data set heat map looks like, okay, with metabolites that are strongly increased and strongly decreased uh, by treatment versus control. So that's it. Um,